we are talking about natural transformations. Uh, so, here are a couple of quotes saying the same thing. Uh, it is not too misleading, at least historically speaking, to say that categories are what one must define in order to define functors, and that functors are what one must define in order to define natural transformations. Uh, and to paraphrase something Scott said to me at lunch the other day, we want to compare ways of doing things, but first we need to say what it means to do a thing but first, we need something to do things to. All right. So what's a natural transformation? We're going to have some functors, f and g, with the same source and target categories. Um, a natural transformation between them, uh, which all right, is alpha. F and I'll use this double arrow to indicate a natural transformation is a collection. All right, and what is it? It's map alpha x from fx to gx for all objects x in the source category. Uh, obviously, these maps are in the target category. All right, uh, these, these are called components. These are, the, so these are the components of the natural transformation, of components. Um, and satisfying the following. We need that this square commutes for all maps in the target uh, in the source category so g f so this is going to be a component of the natural transformation this is another component of the natural transformation and then we have f f and g f so we want this to commute for all maps f from x to y and c all right we might say that the components are natural in x all right, if um, alpha x is an ISO for all x in our category, in our type source category, then um, alpha is a natural isomorphism. All right, so we are introducing an important definition. Let's see some examples. Are all those objects in category D? Uh, which ones? Uh, in the, uh, the corners of the... In this diagram, yes. This diagram commutes in, this, in the target category. All right, so recall that we previously described the free monoid on some set as words or strings of elements in that set. The identity was the empty word, and multiplication was just concatenation of words. You multiply two words by sticking them one in front of the other. All right. So we'll um, let f be the functor from set to monoid. Um, Uh, be the free functor. So uh, we previously described how this was a functor. Um, and we'll let u from monoid to set be the forgetful functor. All right. Uh, there is a natural transformation call epsilon going from fu to identity on monoid. Uh, 
And if you giggled at F U, you're a child. Um, I also giggled at it. Um, so this has as, so this is a, um, a natural transformation with components. And one of the components there uh, evaluates string. So what's happening here, right? Um, epsilon of some, um, let's see, u goes from monoid, so epsilon of some monoid m goes from fum to m. So u forgets that m is a monoid and just remembers that it's a set, and then f gives you this, this free monoid on that set of underlying elements. So you want to take um, this takes some, and, it, and this map is a map of monoids. Um, and we want to go from M1 uh, times OK, so this, this takes an element of this free, free monoid on the set underlying, underlying M, has elements that are strings of elements in M. And it takes this to M by doing the multiplication. So M1, Mn. So here, this is a string. And here, this is the element of M that you get by multiplying these elements of M together. All right, uh, and as an exercise, you should show this is a monoid homomorphism um, to show that it is, in fact, a map in the category of monoids. All right, so what do we need for this to be a natural, this to be a um, natural transformation? We need the following diagram to commute. Fum to m, Fun to n. This is epsilon m. This is epsilon n. This is going to be Fuf. And this is going to be the identity functor applied to f, which is just f. So this is for some um, monoid homomorphism from M to N. And we need this diagram to commute. Um, and so you would do what's called a, um, uh, an element chase to show naturality. So let's see. We have some string here, M1 to Mn. If we go this way, it evaluates to M1 to mn all multiplied together. And then if we do this, well, this is a homomorphism. So it maps to fm1 times fmn. N. So you multiply the image of all these together. If we go this way, well, if we remember what the, what the, um, so the underlying map, so the f applied the under the forgetful function applied to f keeps the function the same. And then when you apply this free thing, well what we said was that when you do that on a string, you just do that to each element. So this is now f of m1 you know, dot to f of mn, where this isn't a product, this is a string of elements in n. And then we do this evaluation map, and lo and behold, we get the same thing. And so the diagram does, in fact, commute. Yes? Oh, uh, I think the orange shows up OK, although I wrote fairly small. It's the green that doesn't show up so good. Um, and hopefully, I think actually it's not so bad now that I'm using two cameras. Um, but thank you for, for keeping it in mind. All right. so. That was our first example. 
We'll see another example. Uh, and this one's just going in the other direction. So we have an after transformation we'll call eta that goes from the identity on the category of sets to uf. And the components are, well, eta of x goes from x to u, f of x. So we took some set. We generated a f the free monoid on it. And that's the monoid of strings. And then we forgot that it was a monoid. So it's the set of strings of elements in x. And so the components of this natural transformation are going to be just sending x to the string of x. Um, and you should do a similar exercise to this to satisfy yourself that it's natural. I'm not going to go through it again. It's a good exercise. OK. So recall that we said that a G set is a functor. And G set is a, func a functor from, so it's some functor x from G underline G, which is the, the like monoid category on the group, a one object category on the group. Um, the set. Uh, also, you, this some people will write this as BG, just so you know. Um, okay. So this is what we've we've shown. We've seen that this is equivalent to a G set. Uh, some set with a, a G action on it. Um, what's a natural transformation between these two things? A natural transformation. Oh, also, I want to say that um, we, we can draw natural transformations like this. So we have, uh, we don't want this. We're going from monoid to monoid. Yeah. So monoid to monoid. And we draw one functor like this. So f u and one functor like this. That's the identity. And then we draw a natural transformation like this. That's eta. So in general, given some natural transformation, we would write c d. And then I have f, g, and then the natural transformation is between them. So in this case, a natural transformation of the form between, between two such functors, say x and y, natural transformation alpha, is a g equivariant map. All right, so it's a single map because the G, the G underlying category has one object. And it goes from uh, x star to y star. But each of these is just a set. So I might, by abusive notation, call this x and call this y. All right, and a morphism in G is an element, uh, is, is, is an element of the group. Um, so naturality is asking that, well, there's only one alpha map to put here. So I'm going to go from uh, x to y. And the only map I can put at the bottom of the square is the same map from x to y. And the only morphism. Uh, that I have to worry about from x to x is, is um, the image x of g, which we saw before was multiplication by g. Oh, maybe I'll do this on the other side. Multiplication by g. And the same thing on this side. So xg equals multiplication by g. 
and I want this to commute, but that's precisely the information of an equivariant map. That's what it means for a map to be G equivariant. Um, that is, if you multiply first with G and then do this, it's the same as doing this and then multiplying with G. OK. Um, we've previously seen simplicial sets. In fact, we defined them as a functor from the delta op category. Uh, so a morphism of simplicial sets as sets uh, is a natural transformation. So we have delta op to set. We have one simplicial set and another simplicial set and a map between them is a natural transformation. And wh what does this look like? So we have x0, y0, x1, y1, uh, x2, y2. And then we had maps this way, maps back down, two maps up, three maps down. and so on. And the natural transformation, well, it's a map between each of the um, images of the objects in here, the objects in here being the natural numbers. So we have a map F0. These are the components now, F1, F2, and so on, such that. And then we just need these squares to commute, Fn. Minus one, uh, xn minus one, yn, yn. Oh. Oof, just barely hit the camera stuff. All right, um, let's switch. Um, all right, so we have uh, here we have the base maps. And here we have uh, f n, f n minus 1. OK, now this square is actually the natural transformation <coughs> square turned the wrong way around, just because like these are the components instead of the top and the bottom. But it doesn't really matter. Yes. <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, all right, so I need that to commute. Yes. Um, all right, and then I also need this basically the same square for the degeneracy maps. So y n, y n plus one. <coughs> so this is f n. This is f n plus one. Uh, this is s i. This is s i. Okay. So that's what it means to have a morphism of simplicial sets. Um, right. Uh, and we can compose natural transformations, but I'm actually going to get to that after taking a little bit of a detour, and we're going to talk about determinants. So, all right, now there are like lots of equivalent definitions of what it means to be a determinant. Um, the thing I want to think about is there exists a unique map, or a unique, we might even say function, debt which goes from n by n matrices over some ground field to that field such that debt is linear in each row the determinant of the identity matrix is 1 and the determinant of some matrix A is 0 if the rank of A is less than N alright um, 
I wrote equals zero here, and that's wrong. Um, all right, so this is, this is one characterization of the determinant. I don't know if it's the one that you guys have seen, um, but it's sort of like, because, it, because it's, it exists and is unique, it sort of is the defining, like these are the defining characteristics of this as a function. All right, and now I'm gonna show you a better definition. Um, and show that that better definition is equivalent to this definition. So recall that we defined the um, nth exterior power of some vector space. So we defined it as if you take the product of n copies of the vector space, um, it's the vector space um, satisfying the uni uh, wedge, n, wedge n v, satisfying the universal property that if you have some, uh, and, it co and it comes equipped with an anti-symmetric multilinear map, so this is anti-symmetric multilinear, uh, and this is also anti-symmetric, multilinear. All right, so given this vector space comes equipped with this map, and given uh, an anti-symmetric multilinear map from this product into another vector space, there is a unique just linear map from here to here. That's the universal property of the exterior power, the nth exterior power of n. All right, and given, and we also saw that uh, given, given a map uh, of vector spaces from B to W, uh, we in fact get something that looks like this. So we have the uh, product of n copies of V, we have the product of n copies of W, and we have, um, wedge n v and wedge n w. All right. We get a map. The map f induces a map between the products um, by just acting on each component. Uh, this comes with a map that is anti-symmetric and multilinear. And this comes with a map that is anti-symmetric and multilinear. And I'm not going to show this, but if you um, do a linear map and then an anti-symmetric multilinear map like this, their composition is also, is, this composition is also anti-symmetric and multilinear. Um, and so in fact we get an induced, um, we get an induced map here uh, by this universal property of, of this object. So there exists a unique linear map here and so in particular, this construction, um, wedge n, is a functor from vector spaces over f to vector spaces over f. All right, so I might call this f tilde, whatever. Or really, wedge n f, uh, probably more appropriate. All right, so what's happening here? Uh, I didn't give myself a lot of space. Um, but if I have something in here, this is v1 up to vn. That's just a vector in v for, from 1 to n. This map, well, it's going to do the obvious thing, which is it's going to send it to f of v1 up to f of vn. Um, this, in, this map here, OK, now I am assuming some explicit construction on here. Um, and on the nth exterior power, the, the thing that you get is um, like you get a basis from the basis, from a chosen basis of V, where the basis elements are like um, every way of writing, like uh, choosing n of the basis elements elements um, and writing like E1 wedge dot 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 up to 
wedge en such that no two of them are the same and you can you can explicitly order them by starting from the smallest chosen basis element and going up because the anti-symmetric thing lets you pass things past themselves. Yes? Um, yes, yes. So in the same way that an explicit construction of, of um, in the same way that an explicit construction of tensor powers is, is a quotient, in fact, you're, you're quotienting by an ideal that includes that ideal. Um, because of the multilinearity. Um, okay, so this is just going to go to v1 wedge up to vn, and this map sends things to fv1 wedge wedge up to fvn, and that's what that looks like. So this thing commutes. Um, so. Um, Okay, so wedge n is a, is a functor from vect k, or vect f, sorry, we're using, to vect f. All right, so now when we talk about determinants, we talk about them for uh, finite dimensional um, transformations between vector spaces. So we're gonna let uh, n be the dimension of some vector space v. Um, and just to make things easy, we'll pick uh, e1 up to en as a basis for v. Um, so I'm talking about a basis. What I'm talking about is basis independent. I'm not going to show that. Um, if that's something you care about, you should definitely spend a bit of time thinking about it and satisfy yourself that it's true. All right, so um, wedge n of v is spanned by e1 wedge up to en. So it, it's, it's in fact a one-dimensional vector space. Um, because if any of these two were the same, then anti-symmetry would mean it's zero. Um, so, this, so this is a one-dimensional vector space. Um, and so, so given an endomorphism of the vector space f from v to itself, um, it's not showing up. Uh, we have that wedge n of f going from wedge n of v to wedge n of v. Uh, is just multiplication by some alpha in f, OK? Because it's a linear transformation from a, from a one-dimensional vector space to itself. So it's literally just multiplication. All right. Uh, then the determinant of this map f is alpha. The top exterior power is the determinant of that linear transformation. Um, OK, now let's say some things about this. Um, so I wrote some stuff here. And then as I got further, I realized some of it was like <coughs> unnecessary. And I can't remember which bits were unnecessary. So I'm going to write down a bunch of stuff. And not all of it is going to be required. Uh, <laughs> So let's, let's let A in the n by n matrices over F um, be the representing matrix, um, represent F uh, in the chosen basis. OK. 
okay? Um, right. Okay, so A is going to be like, this is some A, I, J, right? That's, that's how you write matrices. Um, <coughs> okay, then we have, we have that um, F of E1 wedge up to where, uh, F of EN. So this is applying, um, we're sort of doing this, right? We're doing, this is, this is the image of, um, of the, this is the image of the basis element of this under this linear transformation. Um, this is equal to, all right, and now this is kind of gross. It's a sum um, from i equals 1 to n of a. Oh, maybe I should do this on a separate line. So this is, this is equal to a sum from i equals 1 to n of a i1 times ei, right? So f is a linear transformation from v to itself. Um, we're doing the first column. We're sending, we're sending E1 to the first column of the matrix. Um, so that's what happens on that piece of the wedge. And then we wedge that with everything else. And here we get wedge from, uh, we get I from 1 to N of A, I, N, E, I. Great. OK, so. By anti-symmetry, so we can use, we have that this is multilinear. So we can expand this out, right? We just like start expanding here and then end up expanding here. We get a bunch of terms, um, and they're all wedges of elements, uh, of entries of the matrix multiplied by basis elements. So by anti-symmetry, the only terms which survive um, are of the form uh, how did I write this? I wrote A sigma 1 1 E sigma 1 wedge up to a sigma n, n up to e sigma n for some sigma in the symmetric group on n elements. So the point is the only things that survive are the ones where you have one copy of each basis element. Um, because any, any entries that um, where you have two copies of each basis element are killed by anti-symmetry. OK. But then each of these elements has precisely one entry from a given row. Um, and so because of that, so it has, it has, it only, let's see. It has, um, has precisely one coefficient from each row. So scaling a row scales each, each sum end that still lives to the end. And so scaling a row by some alpha scales what you end up with. Um, all right, so I don't think I'll write that out. Um, does anyone not? Is anyone bothered by that? Does that make sense? OK. Um, so also because of this, if one of the rows is 0, because there's a term from every row, precisely one term from every row in the surviving elements, if every term in a row is 0, then all of these are killed. Uh, so we've shown this, and we've shown this. Um, <coughs> A 
anti-symmetry um, anti is uh, that, um, like, EI wedge EI is 0. Um, and in fact, that gives you that, say, like, EI wedge EJ is equal to negative EJ wedge EI. And this is really what we mean by anti-symmetry. This is what we mean by anti-symmetry, and we say it like this because in characteristic two, things are weird. Um, all right, OK. Um, and, and finally, if we do the if we if we do this with the identity thing, then precisely um, wedge n of the identity on v. Uh, if we apply this map to the basis e1 wedge up to e n, then that gets sent to the identity on v of e1 wedge up to the identity on En. But then that just returns the, the basis element. So it sends the basis element to itself, and so is multiplication by 1. And so we've shown that um, this exterior power definition of determinants satisfies the three properties that we wrote up as wanting our, our determinant to have. OK, so one of the nice things about this uh, is that Multiplicity, multi the fact that determinants are multiplicative follows from the fact that this is a functor. And composing two functors gives you, yeah. It, it's, you can um, sit down and think about what it means for, for this. Like, the point is that like delta n of g is multiplication by alpha, and delta n of f Oh, sorry, delta n of f is multiplication by alpha. Delta n of g might be multiplication by some beta. And then if you do one after the other, you multiply by alpha, and then you multiply by beta. Um, and so multiplicative determinant follows really easily from this definition. All right. And uh, maybe keeping the determinant stuff on this side, <coughs> we're going to look at determinants from a different perspective. So this was something that I could have done when we, when we sort of talked about functoriality. I haven't said anything about natural transformations here. Uh, but now we're going to look at determinant from a different perspective. Um, and we have a functor, uh, mn, which goes from commutative ring, the category of commutative rings to the category of monoids. Um, and it sends a commutative ring to the monoid of, um, and by matrices over that ring. Uh, so under matrix multiplication, Right, so this is multiplicative monoid uh, rather than additive. And if we have a ring morphism from R to S, we get a map from matrices in R to matrices in S, uh, which is, it sends Rij, so some matrix with entries like this, to F R I J. So we just do F to each of the entries. And we get an N by N matrix uh, valued in R, or with entries of S, sorry. All right, so we also have a forgetful functor from C ring to monoid. Uh, OK, well, it's forgetful, so it sends R to R. Um, which again is a multi. Where, uh, sorry. Uh, so under multiplication, right? Because 
there are two there are two different monoids we could forget to from here. We could forget to the multipli the multiplication, or we could forget to the addition. We're forgetting to the we're we're forgetting the addition and keeping the multiplication. All right, and. Uh, a ring morphism is a homomorphism of multiplicative monoids, so we keep the same map. All right. Uh, for all uh, matrices in MNR, we have we have uh, some. Well, we can say what the determinant. Um, over that ring is for that matrix. Um, and this is in that ring. Uh, we have that the determinant of that over that ring of the identity is still equal to 1 in that ring. Um, and the determinant of uh, of, and the determinant is still multiplicative. So I'm not saying how you define determinant over some arbitrary ring. Uh, it's, I'm pretty sure, the same. Uh, um, OK, so let's see. So. We have a map det R which goes from MNR to UR, right? Because it still does the multiplication thing correctly. So it's so this is a map in the category of monoids. Uh, for all uh, commutative rings. And so we get a natural transformation from C ring, uh, from this matrix functor to this forgetful functor given by the determinant. All right. And I should say this is also the same information um, as Another as a um, so I can keep those components and instead go from C ring to group, where instead of just any matrix here, I just put the general linear group. Sorry? Oh, no, I'm still good here. Um, but thank you. Uh, and here, instead of forget, I use the functor that takes me to the group of um, invertible elements in the ring. And then the same components give me a determinant. A determinant is a natural transformation between these two functors. All right. So what time is it? OK. Uh, all right. Let's talk about this still. OK, so uh, we have, so we've had, we have categories, and categories have objects and morphisms between them. Uh, and now we have functors, which are like maps between categories. Uh, and then we have natural transformations, which are maps between functors. Um, and Often when we have maps, we want to do composition with them. So we can compose uh, natural transformations but in fact, we have two ways of doing composition with natural transformations. So I think the most obvious one is vertical composition. Uh, and that's where we 
have a functor. We have three, funct uh, three functors from C to D. F, G, and H, and two natural transformations b between them. So I'll call this alpha, and I'll call this beta. So we write, so I can, from these two, I can sort of go from F to H. Uh, so we're going to write beta dot alpha, uh, which goes from F to H, <coughs> where, OK, so to describe a natural transformation, um, I have to tell you what the components are. Um, and the components here are just, so it's a, it's a component of beta dot alpha. So it's a component to add some x in C. And it's a map from uh, fx to hx. Um, and we already have a map, alpha x, which goes from fx to gx, and a map beta x, which goes from gx to hx. And so we just compose them. So this is um, beta x composed with alpha x, which is a map from fx to hx. Um, naturality here is essential, is, is, is immediate. You take one of these squares, and then you put it here. And then because the, this square commutes and this square commutes, the outside commutes. Um, and you can either just believe that that's a true thing about commutativity, or you can write down equations. And it's pretty straightforward to see if that's true. All right. So this, I feel like, is the most obvious composition. And the reason it's the most obvious composition is that because, well, we have functors between two categories. And we have natural transformations between them. So that means we should have a category where the objects are functors between two fixed categories. And the morphisms are the natural transformations. And we do, in fact, have that. That's called a functor category. Um, so maybe I'll write that up here. So given categories C and D, we write either fun uh, CD for the category whose objects are functors from C to D and morphisms and natural transformations between those functors. Or we write uh, D with C as a superscript. Um, and this notation makes sense. And the reason this notation makes sense is if you think about some set and you think about, say, like x to the power of n, what is that? That's like, um, that's a sequence, elements xn for n in the natural numbers, which is the same thing as a function from n to x. And that's where this notation comes from, and it's the good notation. Um, all right. Uh, so we write this for the category with um, objects, functors, functors, uh, C to D, and morphisms, uh, natural transformations. All right. Um, so another thing is that for this to be a category in the sense that I would usually say category, which means locally small, both of these categories have to be small um, because otherwise you have too many functors. And so you end up with something that's not locally small if these categories aren't both. Um, 
But of course, we actually do like to think about functor categories between um, where, where one of the two categories is not locally small, is, is not small. And so, yes. Um, the G sets. The, you, you view thinking about G sets um, as a category where the objects are G sets and the maps are equivariant maps between them. Then you're thinking about the functor category from the one object category G underline to the category of sets. And that's not, uh, um, I know in that case the home sets are the home sets are sets. So um, maybe it might be enough that one of the categories is small. Yeah, actually it's probably enough that the source category is small. Mm, I'm not sure. All right. Uh, but I said there were two types of composition. So let's talk about horizontal co composition. So. All right, horizontal composition. All right, we'll do this again with a diagram. So now we're going to have three categories, C, D, and E, and natural transformations like this. So we have F and G, and H and K, and we have a natural transformation from F to G, which I'll call alpha and a natural transformation from H to K, which I'll call beta. <coughs> All right. And we're going to write uh, beta star alpha for the composition. Um, and this is going to be a natural transformation from H composed with F to uh, K composed with G. So it's a natural transformation that goes from this composition to this composition on the bottom. All right, so what are the components here? All right, the components, this is a bit more complicated. Beta star alpha for some x is uh, k applied to alpha x composed with beta applied to f of x. And it's also beta of g of x composed with h applied to alpha of x. All right. Um, that this is a natural transformation is perhaps not so immediate as, uh, as, as the previous one. OK, so first, first we have this diagram, F, so uh, K F of X, H G of X. KG of X. OK, so we want uh, these component maps have to go from, um, for some object in C, they have to go from HF of X to KG of X. Uh, and we naturally have, naturally is a bad choice of words, uh, we have two ways of building a map from HF of X to KG of X. So on f of x, we can do, um, wait a second. Yes. On f of x, so f of x is something in here, we can do the component map. Um, on f of x, we can do h to it, and then we get h f of x, and we can do the component map of beta to get to k. So here we can put beta of f of x. 
And similarly, we can do this on the bottom uh, with g of x. Now, going down here, um, what we want is we want to change this f into a g. So if you ignore the h for a second, we already have a map from f of x to g of x. It's alpha x. And so to get a map from h f of x to h g of x, we just supply h to this map as a functor. And similarly, on this side, we apply k to alpha of x. Now, this square commutes because beta <coughs> is natural with respect to these alpha, uh, these component maps. So this is a naturality square for beta being a natural transformation, um, which means that, so I'm defining the components of this natural transformation, beta star alpha, to be either, way, either of the ways of going around here, because they're equal by the commutativity of this square. All right. We need to show naturality in x for this, these component maps. So we have um, hf of x to hg of x given by this map, h alpha x. Um, and then we have k g of x. And this is beta g of x. So right now, I'm choosing this bottom row, this bottom part of the diagram as, as a definition. You can actually, you can do this, and it's a good exercise. You can do essentially the same proof by, by using this top thing here instead. Um, so this is my component map. Uh, beta star alpha of x. And I need to show naturality in x, which means I need to show it relative to some map f from x to y in my category C. So um, well, I need to apply hf to f. So I get hf of y. And here I'm going to get kg of f from kgx to kgy. And here I want hg of y. And this should be hgx of f. And this is beta star alpha of y. OK. So if this outside square commutes, then this is natural in x. All right. And I didn't write it down. Um, this is beta g of y. This is uh, h alpha of y. OK, so this square commutes because it's a naturality square for beta. This square commutes because if you drop every copy of h, it's a naturality square for alpha. And so when you apply h to it, because h is a functor, it still commutes. And so these two squares commute, and so the whole thing commutes. All right, so maybe I should write that down. This is a. Naturality <coughs> of beta, and this is naturality, naturality of alpha, then apply H. <coughs> okay, does anyone have any questions about that? Did that hopefully make sense? Okay. Uh, here is something that um, I am going to leave to you, uh, although it is actually, I think, maybe a non-trivial exercise. However, both Emily Friel and uh, 
Sanders, Sanders, Saunders, McLean left this as an exercise uh, in their respective books. So, um, and who am I to argue with them that this should be left as an exercise? All right, so this is the middle four interchange. And it says that if you have uh, natural transformations like this, so I have F, G, and H, three functors from C to D, and I have J, K, and L, three functors from D to E. I have a natural transformation here, alpha, natural transformation, beta, and two natural transformations here, uh, gamma and delta, then delta dot gamma star beta dot alpha is the same thing as delta star beta dot gamma star alpha. So what am I saying? I'm saying you can either first compose vertically and then horizontally, or you can compose horizontally and then vertically, and you get the same thing. Um, but I'm not going to prove that. You are if you can be bothered. Um, and next, we're going to talk about the good notion of equality between categories, which is equivalence. All right, we'll take a five-minute break here. <laughs> <laughs>